Go start? Okay. All right. So, uh, what my plan was for today and tomorrow was to talk about two different aspects of development that I think are particularly interesting uh, with respect to morphogenesis and how uh, a fertilized egg assumes the complex body form that ultimately results from any embryo. Uh, today I wanted to talk about how the positional information that's supplied by the mother uh, in the egg is translated into specific developmental programs and the specificity of that process. And then tomorrow I'm going to follow, uh, and that means that today's lecture will be a little bit a follow-up on the one that Art gave this morning, but I'll give you a more personal, experimental, and, and, uh, and, and Bikwite-centric view of the problem. And then tomorrow's lecture will effectively follow up on the lectures that Boris has been giving on mechanics, and again try to supply a embryo-level view of the process. So what I'm going to talk about today, <clears throat> and we've already alluded to this, and you've seen this already, is this transformation of, uh, in morphology uh, in the embryo that, uh, that is underlaid by a pattern of gene expression that builds on this maternal gradient called bicoid. So uh, there's a bicoid is a transcription factor. As we'll see, its RNA is localized at the anterior end of the egg. It establishes a concentration gradient of the protein along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. And that concentration gradient activates gene expression patterns uh, in, uh, in defined regions of the embryo. The first genes to come on are a, a, a set of gap genes. Two examples are uh, hunchback and cripple. And then we'll discuss this in a little bit, but somehow these expression patterns then are relayed to establish a more complex pattern of gene expression called pair rule, gene uh, uh, pair rule expression patterns that are complex and detailed enough that individual rows of cells are now distinct from the cell that's immediately in front of them or behind them. So this little uh, unstained row of cells here are cells that don't express the two, either of the two genes, uh, pair rule genes, paired and runt. And there are seven of these pair rule genes that are expressed in overlapping domains. And so that gives you an extraordinary specificity of cell fates that are defined at this period. And it's that specificity of, uh, of that detail of expression that allows specific morphological events to occur at this stage. Now. Um, I'm particularly going to focus on this early step, which is the, the transmission of information from the bicoid protein gradient to uh, the downstream to zygotically activate the transcription of these genes here. This process occurs in the early embryo over the first two to three hours. So it's a relatively rapid process. Remember, the fly embryo starts its development with fertilization. The nuclei replicate without intervening cytokinesis. So you have an initial stage, which is a syncytial stage, until there are 13 rounds of division. Uh, <clears throat> after 13 rounds of division, there are about 6,000 nuclei on the surface, about 100 nuclei of along the anterior posterior axis of the egg. And at that point, these nuclei uh, cease dividing. They subdivide, they're subdivided into individual cells by membrane synthesis. And it's during this period here that this uh, individual, that these transcription patterns become, reach their final magnitude and appear to establish defined states. Now, the way people think about that happening, and this is the kind of a textbook view, is that if you have a graded distribution of this protein, the individual genes that are activated by bicoid expression are activated, have enhancers that will 
uh, have affinity for bicoid at different concentrations. So there'll be some enhancers which are relatively low affinity, some enhancers that are relatively high affinity. Each enhancer, you know what I mean when I say enhancer, right? Okay, suddenly I had this horrible feeling like, my God, okay. So um, that enhancers are built in a way to have different concentration sensitivities and those, uh, uh, those enhancer sensitivities defines thresholds, Bitcoin concentration thresholds that define boundaries of gene expression. That's the simple basic model that we all work with. Uh, this is a, the, the, the Bitcoin uh, uh, is the major determinant for anterior and for actually I believe substantially most of the patterning in the fly embryo. It is though a special case. There are certain features here that are, that you don't find duplicated in other organisms. The idea of, um, well, there are localized messenger RNAs in many unfertilized eggs. What's peculiar, largely peculiar, is that this uh, embryo remains a syncytion, so the movement of the molecules from the source is moving through the cell rather than around cells. That's going to change how we think about the process a little bit. But uh, I <laughs> couldn't begin this without having a little session to tell you why I think Bitcoin is so cool. Okay, so that's um, why was the discovery by uh, Christiana Nussein Volhard in her lab uh, 15, 20 years ago so, so um, exciting? Uh, as the picture emerged, I think one of the things that it suggested for, to us as developmental biology was that information in biology was potentially simple, small number of molecules, and that information was also quantitative. You could measure it, and that the response of cells, uh, therefore, so when the information is quantitative, and then the response of cells, and therefore cell fate, depends on the ability of cells to read concentration levels and to make and points us in the direction that the important feature is the ability of cells to read, as we will see, subtle very small differences in concentration along a concentration gradient. Another feature is the, the way this gradient actually arises. You can see and measure the initial source. And the information, though, is not in the source. The information is not really present in the egg the way the mother makes it. The information-rich content evolves during early embryonic development to produce a final information-rich distribution. And there is a feeling, and I, I think this is still true, although it's what we're really struggling with here, is that you can understand that how that final uh, information-rich uh, distribution arises from relatively simple physical parameters. So we ought to be able to understand this. If we can't, in fact, I would argue that if we can't understand bicoid, we're not going to be able to understand anything. The limits, uh, it's a, this, this is the ideal test system for us to test our thinking about diffusion, degradation, many of the ideas that, that Art raised this morning. The third thing that's interesting about bicoid uh, is that um, actually, although bicoid is essential and important in fly development, it is a fairly newly evolved gene. Most of the dipterin, uh, other fly, many of the other highly evolved fly species have bicoid, but not all, but bicoid evolved during the evolution what are called the uh, advanced or acalypterate diptera. So there's a little branch of all of the dipterin flies that have bicoid protein. And it is not used in patterning anyplace else. But what's interesting then 
is that this is a patterning mechanism that evolved about 200, I don't know, 200 million years ago. So, and as this, the, the, this family of insects has evolved, the bicoid protein and its use and the properties that govern its divi uh, distribution have also evolved and changed over time. So we can, what's really nice, since this is such a small, discrete little area of the animal kingdom, you can follow how an evolutionary solution is then modified or adjusted to allow development, as we'll see in this talk, in bigger and smaller eggs. Because it's this single thing that has evolved, and then how does one, uh, uh, how, uh, how, does, how, do organ how do those processes uh, organize, uh, change over time? So what I thought I would do, and actually this is, uh, is to just go over a couple of the experiments that we've done over the past um, 10 years now that were really designed to put this model onto a, a more... Uh, physical or dynamic basis. Uh, basically, the idea of these experiments was to try to establish physical measurements for bicoid concentration, half-life, diffusion, that would allow us to actually test our cartoon models. And what I'm going to do is just going to go through some of those measurements just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we know or think we know about the molecule. Also, the kinds of measurements and our best estimations for any of these values that we have right now. And what I, I would uh, hope to do is, to, uh, depending on how we manage time, in this, is at the very, at the end of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aim to end early. And then by end early, I would <clears throat> like to have a discussion that is totally unprepared, but totally triggered by Art Lander's lecture this morning of, can we make a list on the blackboard comparing a, a morphogen gradient, say the DPP gradient in, that operates in an epithelium in the wing and bicoid gradient, and compare different features, different parameters, different uh, anything that we can think of to try to begin sorting out what elements are going to be important in one system, what are going to be important in the other. So I'm going to go through, therefore, a kind of a limited subset of uh, things that we can measure in Bitcoin. But I tried to pick the, the, the recent ones. And that's the first half of the lecture. And then what I'd like to do in the second half is really focus in on information transfer to ask how much information is in the bicoid gradient? How much position, how can we define that in some quantitative kind of way that tells us, that allows us to quantitate the information content in the gradient and then ask how that information content is transferred to the first tier of genes in terms of transcriptional responses, uh, that is activation gap genes. And then what I'd like to do for the last 15 uh, <laughs> minutes of that experimental part is to talk about some recent experiments that we've done to really get in and look at the enhancers that respond to the bicoid gradient and try to get a, a sense of how it is that these individual enhancers are able to measure concentrations accurately. What are the features? If you were in a biological system, we're going to build genes that would respond to different concentrations. How do you do that? We don't have any idea, really, in terms of how, uh, uh, what, what features of an enhancer would be essential for it to measure concentration. And that, I think, is one of the really powerful places where we can use Bitcoin. So I'm going to talk about uh, and end up with a model for what are the features, and then we can ask whether those features are sufficient to actually account for the accuracy and concentration measurements that we see. So that's the plan. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs>
So what I decided I would focus mostly on is time scales. Remember, this gradient arises in about, uh, you know, the whole process is over in about two to two and a half hours in embryonic development. So that's our big time, that's the, time, the big time scale of work. But I would like to kind of break it into little units and say, what do we know about any of the individual components? How soon can we see protein, uh, things like that? And so um, I'm just going to show you some pictures and give you some numbers and give you some idea of what's the, the normal dynamics of this process. OK, if you look at uh, embryos right Look at eggs before they're fertilized. They're actually hard to get out intact and attractive. Uh, but the bicoid RNA is localized as little clusters tightly bound to the plasma membrane, anterior plasma membrane of the egg. And females can make these eggs and store them and keep them for two to three weeks with this RNA bound at these sites. And not being translated. It's just a bound RNA. When the female lays the egg, the egg is activated, actually goes through the final steps of meiosis, is fertilized by a sperm, and those events lead to a dispersal of the RNA and a release from the translation block. And it's at fertilization that the RNA begins to be translated into a protein. We know that, well, I won't go into the numbers. I there are about 100,000 RNA molecules from uh, various estimates in the egg. And they probably make 50 times as many uh, protein molecules. I didn't check those numbers. I'm kind of making them up. But that's, that's the order of magnitude that we're going to deal with here. So now these are images of flyers. Once I we've stained with DAPI so we can follow the cleavage divisions. And what I wanted to show you was that by the time there are about 32 nuclei in the egg, you can see it's still a syncytium and the nuclei are still kind of scattered around here. We can begin to detect bicoid protein in nuclei at about to about 40% egg length. And we can follow that. So within about 40 minutes of the release of this RNA and the, the beginning of translation, we begin to see RNA all the way out to this point. Uh, this is obviously a detection problem. Yes? Does the protein only come from the maternal mRNA, or does the embryo also? That's the, the protein only comes from the messenger RNA that is anchored at the anterior end of the embryo. Of the, and no, no, absolutely not. It is one, a single source. We can show that genetically. You could imagine how we might be able to show that genetically. The synthesis of this RNA depends totally on the genotype of the mother. And removal of this RNA, uh, any zygotic, uh, the embryo does not transcribe. Uh, overall, I should also say that transcription is very, very low until the very final cleavage divisions. So the embryo is not capable of making any protein other than uh, from maternal RNAs that are supplied. Are there other questions? Yeah. Oh. Before fertilization? Do you think this? I, I would say this is less diffuse than this. I, I, yeah. It, and so there is a transition. Other questions? Ah, so it's just a blow up so that you can see in these two nuclei that we're beginning to accumulate bicoid. Now, we can follow. Those were actually antibody stainings, and that is an easier. We can follow the synthesis. This, once nuclei reach the surface, and you can see here 
the establishment of this gradient. You can see that it's graded. You can see that the protein being in transcription factor localizes to the nucleus. Uh, by this point, we've entered cycle 14. And the, this, and the cells have read and can distinguish these um, concentrations. If you apply that, if you, the concentration differences between individual nuclei along the anterior posterior axis are on the order of 10 to 15 percent from one nucleus to the next to the next. This is an exponential decline, but individual nuclei. That is the difference, then, that if cells are going to determine a maximally precise boundary, that's the concentration difference that they must be able to detect. Thomas Greger, when he was in the lab, uh, developed this, the first of the, the usable Bicoid GFPs, and showed that by nuclear, certainly by nuclear cycle 11, if you measured the intensity of staining and therefore the concentration of bicoid protein in the nucleus of individual nuclei, that that concentration was stable by uh, cycle 11, 12, 13, and 14. Uh, the protein goes into the nucleus. And as you saw in the movie, when the cells would divide, the protein would leave the nucleus go out into the cytoplasm. You can actually see this little increase in cytoplasmic levels during mitosis, and then a return rapid immediately. Actually, one of the fastest returns I've seen of pr nuclear proteins into the nucleus after the completion of mitosis. Now, the, so the patterns are stable. Another way of looking at that, that Thomas did, was to measure the bicoid concentration in the individual nucleus anywhere along the length of the egg and then allow the cells to divide and then measure the concentration or the intensity in the daughters. And that's what's plotted here. And what you can see is that they lie on a, a diagonal that says 1, which means that essentially the daughters have the same intensity, uh, bicoid concentration, as the, as the mothers. Um, OK. So you will see. Pardon? Uh, the gradient is set like initially by cell cycle one, two, three, four, as well as it's up. It's the, you can see it arising. I showed it to you at cell site, but we don't see the we, uh, we've not been able to easily resolve the protein that early. It's just it, it obviously what happens is that initially it cannot be stable. You have a large amount of RNA, but a small amount of protein that you've just made. And, uh, is it no, the protein is only produced where the RNA is. The and you, can only happens of the protein, not of the RNA. Exactly. The diffusion only. And the RNA is probably, uh, we've also measured the distribution of the RNA, and about 90% per, 90 of the RNA, even though it becomes rather diffuse, is localized in this area. Here. So protein moves from the site of synthesis through the rest of the embryo. Other questions? Yes? Oh, this? Yeah. Yes. You would see more and more. OK. Uh, it's, that's probably true, because what's happening here is that we're increasing the number of nuclei by a factor of two with each uh, nuclear division. So, But we are maintaining the same concentration per nucleus. The nuclei are actually getting slightly smaller. But the total amount of bicoid signal and is going up still. And this is one of the complicated things about the process, that the total signal measured in nuclei on the surface of the egg continues to rise during the cleavage divisions, although the concentration in each nucleus, 
and the concentration of each nucleus falls along the anterior posterior axis, but in a given region of the egg, it that concentration is constant. Okay. So, ah, <clears throat> so what you'd like to know, though, uh, so the ability to establish a um, a stable gradient from a stable source of RNA, a stable uh, RNA, the amount of RNA is constant, so you're going to be making protein at a constant rate, and that protein is the shape of the gradient, the distribution of the protein is essentially going to depend on the diffusion of the protein from the source of synthesis, and its lifetime. <laughs> so a critical thing to measure then, if you want to, uh, is whether, uh, or it is in part the lifetime of the protein that will determine how long it will take for this gradient to achieve stability. So we wanted to measure the lifetime of the protein. And the way that we did that was with uh, photoactivatable fusion proteins. And the one that we love is a protein called DROMPA. And it has a peculiar property in that it's actually a photoswitchable protein that switches from a dark state to a, a light state, depending on the wavelength illumination. What's, uh, and that's opposed to uh, a protein that simply switches to a light state from it. So what's attractive for us about DROMPA, and I, I'm giving you a sales pitch on DROMPA, is that you can, it, this is a flip of a position of a metal, in the, and you can do this switch back and forth a hundred times, and the protein just goes dark light, dark light, dark light. Uh, with, and we've, if you use a photoactivatable form, there, the standard photoactivator will require much more energy to do the flips, and they're not as easily reversible. So what we do is we turn all the protein to dark. Oh, and the last thing is that it still flips in fixed material. So this is actually a fixed embryo that Oliver Grimm, who made the stock, wrote Bitcoin on the embryo and photoactivated uh, the uh, Bitcoin in this embryo, in this fixed embryo. So on the ease of use, it's ideal. The only disadvantage is you can't see it till you're done with your experiment. You have to believe that it's there. It's not like a switching from green to red, where you saw it and you made it red from red and it was green. You have to start with an embryo that's dark and do stuff. That's, that, that is the, a, a psychological, at least a psychological disadvantage. OK, so um, two interesting features about degradation is um, we can measure. So the way you do these experiments is you would uh, use the, the photo switchable as to change the popular, change all the uh, bicoid in the embryo so they do a dark state, uh, or measure it, change it all to the dark state, and then change it back to uh, a light to the light state and ask how much is still there, or subtract one population from the other, figure out the lifetime, figure out how much has been degraded during the, the minute or two minute or five minute or ten minute interval that you've allowed degradation to occur. Uh, two interesting features is that degradation for, follows first order kinetics. That's just what you would expect of a protein that has an inherent lifetime. There's nothing out there degrading bicoid other than just the overall milieu. And it is uniform along the entire axis of the embryo. So we're not, we don't have uh, anything, we're not going to be able to use degradation as measured by these qualities to, 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 to shape the gradient. Lifetime is the same. And this makes us believe, an obvious, so there's no obvious feedback on concentration uh, uh, and uh, the, the establishment of the gradient. It just, again, Source of RNA makes protein, <laughs> diffuses, and degrades. Questions? This you have mentioned that cycles like this, this for the, all the cycles? Yeah. The rates, right. The rates are the same. It, uh, 
at all cycles. Uh, this was its early cycle 14, but we measured in some of the early, it gets slightly more difficult in the earlier cycles because they're shorter. So if the cycle is only eight to 10 minutes, you have less time. But overall, there doesn't seem to be any change. The, the lifetime is this, actually. Our measurements during the early the cycles 12, 13, and 14, where we can do this, suggest that the life, our best calculation, is something like 50 minutes for the protein. And then when the embryo enters cycle 14 and the gradient is used, we see a rapid change in the lifetime. So this is the only developmentally regulated point in bicoid lifetime that we see, and that the lifetime falls to about 15 minutes. And actually, what you observe in the embryo is very rapid. The levels of bicoid fall. We think this is because by this point, and we believe probably at this point, but uh, the concentrations are red, and uh, you don't want the information around anymore. A lifetime of about 50 minutes. What was the relationship between lifetime and being able to establish uh, stable was about three. Uh, uh, There's a couple of lifetimes. Yeah, so, yeah, so we're in the ballpark of the, about the right lifetime to get us a stable gradient by uh, cycle 12, 13, 14. It's not perfect. The lifetime's a little bit too long by about 10 minutes. And we don't know whether, you know, I, I think overall we're just going to run with this number and say this is probably close enough and we're in the right order of magnitude. Okay. Pardon? No one knows. At least I don't know. We've tried to do some things. Uh, if you look at the sequence, you can find regions that are called pest sequences that are thought to govern lifetime in other proteins, but no one knows how to interpret the sequences into a lifetime. Uh, we don't know who degrades the protein. We don't, uh, we've looked at some modifications. Sometimes proteins are ubiquinated or otherwise sumulated or things that change their lifetime. We haven't found, uh, uh, we're, we're dumb. At the, uh, we don't really know. Question. We don't know that. Uh, do we know that? We might know it, and I could have forgotten it. We, uh, if the egg is laid and activated but not fertilized by sperm, it's called an unfertilized egg. It will establish, it will initiate bicoid translation, but there's no nuclei there. And we could, and I believe Jeff Draco in the lab did measure lifetime of the protein under those circumstances. And I, I honestly can't remember whether it's very different. It wasn't like, oh, change our world view of how the process is occurring. That implies that if an unfertilized egg, there can be a gradient of the protein. Then that means the mRNAs are released even when the sperm hasn't made contact with the egg. Yes, so the mRNAs are released into this translational, and this is, this is something that's known for general translation, actually, that there is an activation process, and this is also true for many embryos, that it's not entry of sperm, but some process that's called activation that involves a calcium influx most times uh, in most embryos that somehow activates and occurs simultaneously with sperm entry. But sperm aren't necessary for, you're right, absolutely right, for activating this process. Normally, they occur simultaneously. OK. Ah, and so. Uh, one of the things that is obviously interesting from the standpoint of where degradation occurs, one of the features is nuclei, that, that when we look at the protein, except during mitosis, we generally see the protein in the nucleus. So the sense is that uh, the 
you're establishing a gradient of nuclear protein. And so the question that uh, Oliver Grimm wanted to ask is, does this diffusion pattern, this um, accumulation, the final shape, does it depend in some way on bicoid being, say, trapped in the nucleus? Does that slow down its diffusion? Uh, there were two, uh, uh, in a way, I'll, um, I'll show you this, this result. And then. So what Oliver did to address this was he made a mutant form. Of, we don't know very much about bicoids. The control of bicoids nuclear entry doesn't have an obvious NLS, uh, nuclear localization sequence. It, uh, but what was known was that somewhere in the region of the protein actually fairly close to the homeo domain, so, uh, which is the DNA binding domain of bicoid protein, you could delete that, those uh, bases, and you would make a, you would still make a stable bicoid protein, but the protein no longer partitions specifically into the nucleus. So this is a wild type normal protein that's been tagged with CFP, and you can see the standard bicoid gradient. And this is a YFP tag version of the mutant form, and you can see that it's cytoplasmic, or cytoplasmic and nuclear. We know that this is something to do with the entry rates, the impact of this mutation on entry rates uh, into the nucleus. Again, we don't know enough about bicoid of the actual process of nuclear localization to say what's really going on here. But again, you have a messenger RNA. It's translated into a protein. And now what we can do, because these are differently tagged, we can put these two constructs into the same fly and follow the levels of the, red pro the CFP versus YFP and ask, is there any difference? And along the entire length of the egg, the entry into the nucleus makes no difference on the shape of the gradient. Now, this is kind of like a surprising result. It must be spending all of its time in the nucleus. But that is a, based on looking at the staining patterns and localization. That's what you might think. But uh, actually, we all, in retrospect, thinking you can do a FRAP experiment uh, where you can photobleach a nucleus and then ask how long does it take for that nucleus to recover. And that kind of photobleaching experiment is a little bit more um, reliable <laughs> than some of the, 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 the issues that, that uh, art raises. When, but when you do that, you find that even though bicoid is localized clearly to the nucleus, the entire population of bicoid is moving in and out of the nucleus with a half-life or a half-time of about 60 seconds. So bicoid is going in and out of the nucleus, into the cytoplasm, becoming dispersed where we don't see it so well, but constantly being uh, uh, partitioned, probably by uh, you know, in a concentration-dependent way that's similar to how you would phase partition solubilities between two, two domains. And the, the cytoplasmic domain is much bigger. And, but you're constantly, you're making, uh, uh, OK. So I realized, OK. Yeah, uh, this is, right, and so. You make the gradient. You probably make the gradient in the cytoplasm. It partitions into the nucleus and supplies information. Uh, at a given point, when it's you know above a threshold, we can look and say Hunchback is kind of picture this is oversaturated. You should see here, it would bicoid would bind to and activate transcription of this Hunchback gene. Now, what I'm showing you here is actually. A slightly different view. We're not focusing on the surface. We're focusing through the midline, you know, through the optical midline of the embryo. And what I just wanted to show is that, ah, and I didn't point out to you is that during these syncytial stages, most of the nuclei migrate to the surface, but there's a certain fraction of the nuclei that are just left in the cytoplasm. You can't see them there. You could have 
potentially seen them in the earlier figures. And what I wanted to show you is that you can measure bicoid concentration. And this partitioning here as well. And we don't see a, it's tricky to measure whether the internal gradient is exactly the same as the surface gradient, but they are very, very similar. And in terms of transcriptional responses, they also activate hunchback, again, in a border that corresponds to the border at the surface. So we think basically the protein's going through the cytoplasm, it's there, and somehow partitioning into the nucleus. Questions? Yes? Yeah. What becomes a, a these these nuclei here? There's bicoid RNA here that we don't see, that's being translated into bicoid protein that is accumulating in these nuclei. Uh, there is bicoid RNA only here. Ah, so, uh, yeah, are, are you asking that if you have a, a, a diffuse mass of bicoid RNA, could some of the bicoid protein doesn't have to go too far to get to those nuclei? And that's true. That's probably true. It doesn't have to go too far to get to these either. It has a harder time getting to these or these. And so we think that it's diffusing probably with the same kinetics. One of the reasons for that and that I didn't show you is that if you take a gap gene like cripple that would normally be expressed in this area here in response to bicoid, we see bicoid coming up. We see cripple coming up here. That would have been a better demonstration that the protein is, again, moving away from its source, establishing a concentration gradient. Are there other questions? Bicoid concentration in, on the periphery side, in cytoplasm, periphery, and in the yolk. So you say they are almost the same. I would say they're almost the same. Yeah. I, I have not measured that. I measured it. And what did you find? I find there is nothing in the yolk. So That's exciting. I mean, for a variety of reasons. One, we're turning on hunchback or cripple, known bicoid responsive genes in a pattern that. Uh, it's so little. It's, so in nuclei, you have the highest concentration. As you go to cytoplasm, the concentration goes way too low. Yeah. And as I do, do measurement in, in your, it's just very close to that. And I'm not very deep in the. Yeah, so, so very possibly uh, what you need to do is look in nuclei in the, in the yolk. Because if you look at this figure, I would, say, I would say exactly that's what I see. You know, there's, oh, let's see, there's more protein here and then less as you're going through here. So you do an overall, you'd say, ah, no protein, oh, boom. And when you hit the nucleus, you would see bicoid protein. I bet. I guess it's worth it to... To, to, to maybe to, to, to look at that again. This is at least the way it looks like for us. Now, OK. Uh, so overall, we think that the measurements that we've gotten so far, and I, I think I, did I not include? Nope. OK. So. Uh, Things that we've gotten are basically compatible with a really simple model for how you produce this gradient. You have a constant amount of RNA translated at a constant rate, has a constant degradation uh, lifetime, and moves with a certain dynamic and makes a gradient. So, and that works in flies. Now I want to come to an interesting thing that we've never really fully been able to understand. Uh, and that's that, as you all know from your own personal experiences, flies have, are a very wonderful and diverse species of animals. And they come in different sizes. So they're really 
attractive, beautiful, you know, like Drosophila wonderful flies that are wonderful in the lab and that you can't, your heart immediately goes out to with great affection. <laughs> I said that to make you guys laugh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and then uh, there are these ugly, annoying ones that show up at picnics or in your house and buzz around and they're huge and ugly. And, and they're partially ugly because they're so big. And uh, well, it, you know, it's interesting, not only are the flies big, but the embryos are big. So the, the species like blowflies and uh, houseflies make these. Uh, this is a Califera egg. This is a housefly egg. These are Drosophila melanogaster eggs. Uh, there are even some little, um, there's a, another species of Drosophila called Drosophila buski, which makes eggs that are about 300 rather than 500. So you get this whole range of egg sizes. And yet all of these are fairly closely related diptera. And they all have bicoid, and they all use bicoid to pattern the embryos. So um, you could ask, how does this work? Ah, well, they're close enough that actually uh, you can use many of the standard Drosophila reagents and say, do they have gap genes? Do they have pair rule genes? Do they show, are these expression patterns similar um, in um, uh, the different insects? Uh, and what you can see is that, yeah, the eggs can be big, eggs can be small, and you establish the same patterns of gene expression. The other thing that's really interesting, uh, especially for some of the things that Stefano talked about, is that the early development of these, of these different species are very, very similar. So they all take about two and a half hours to reach the cellularization. The, uh, uh, they all go through 13 rounds of division and stop. The big ones have make blastoderms that are big, but they have the same number of cells. And they're all very similar in all these respects. The one thing that's different and weird is that their eggs are of different sizes. And so what we would like to know is, how do you do this? Uh, obviously, you can make a gradient, and you can make a gradient in it. If you have a longer egg, you keep a gradient with the same properties, and it would extend out farther but had lower concentrations. So you would adjust the cis regulatory, the enhancers of all of these response genes to allow you to adjust for the size of the egg. That would be a cool way of doing it. Or you can somehow change the distribution or the length scale of the bicoid gradient. And the answer is that when you look at the gradient in Drosophila buski, which is 300, or Drosophila melanogaster in green, which is 500, you look at the shapes of the gradients, or uh, Lucilia, which is one of these big flies, the gradients are bigger in the bigger eggs. And you can show, if you collapse, if you plot the data not in terms of microns, but in terms of percent egg length, you collapse all of these gradients back onto themselves. So what that means is that the distributions are what scales here is the distribution of bicoid. You can go back now, and you can say, well, what is the properties that the bicoid gradient depends on the distribution is like half-life and diffusion. We know pure diffusion. Thomas Greger injected different fluorescent probes into the eggs, and you could measure diffusion. It's the same in all of these. So it almost has to be the, the, something special about the proteins that have different half-lives in these species. And that might be uh, maybe the best model. Uh, what Alistair McGregor did was to then clone out the Bicoy genes from these other insect species. And you can plot them out and look at them here. And you know, it is pretty much, you know, there's a certain degree of conservation, certain things that are different between them. Nothing truly very helpful. They all have this 
conserved pest degradation region. They all have the homeo domain. They all look like bicoid. There's no doubt this is bicoid. These are the bicoid proteins from these. And what he then asked was if one took these bicoid genes from other species and uh, you tag them with GFP and you make transgenic Drosophila melanogaster by putting these big bicoids that make big gradients into the little tiny egg. You, know, you can imagine one thing. We thought we were going to get big gradients and little tiny eggs, and they would just fill up the whole egg with bicoid, and that would be really interesting. And we could have spent the next year just looking at interesting phenotypes, and it would all have been very exciting. But actually, what happens is that you put the big bic the bicoid from the big insects into the small eggs and the size of the bicoid gradient scales to the size of the egg. What that means is that it's um, with, uh, comparable lambdas. Uh, uh, yes? Yes? Uh, the sequence of the bicoid promoter. Uh, oh, you think if you made more protein, you could it would be one of the ways that you could do this. Uh, it actually doesn't making more protein gives you doesn't work. It gives you a, a bigger uh, gives you a higher rate of synthesis presumably, but the shapes uh, are not going to scale. The lambda. Uh, let's. I have to work this thing through. Uh, can we say yes? Would you believe me for a second, and then we'll go back to this discussion? Okay. Uh, so changing rates of synthesis doesn't help. The the, the problem this is a has to be a uh, an odd conserved property of the protein. And yeah. Oh yes, of course. That would be cool to do, and we haven't done it. But that's a great thing. Or you could even, um, there might be a, you, all right, so part of the problem is working with these ugly flies, because we are not able to grow them in the lab. They have long, and so we order them. So we, one of the things we couldn't do the reverse transgenesis. And put the, but we could always, but you're right, we could always get the flies, get an extract, and just measure, uh, measure lifetimes. I think that would be a great thing to do. And then you could chop the protein in half and measure the lifetime so that you could begin uh, a structure function analysis to begin to address what really it is, what it is that controls the lifetime and what the degradation process is. We don't know. Uh, so, uh, what it does suggest though that Bitcoin. As a protein is built, uh, uh, this protein is conserved. The property, uh, uh, so what's conserved is bicoid protein as the egg changes in length scale. A property of the egg must change in this model that would change the, the lifetime of the protein. And it would be interesting um, to know if those are the same. Uh, how the, the how the properties relate to to, to egg length? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going to stop there. That's the that's the, the probably the coolest experiments that we have in the past ten years in, in Bitcoin, and they've kind of you know I think they've helped us to think about the process, but they're still kind of open ended in terms of our understanding mechanistically or biochemistically. Uh, again, yes. Yeah. And now the initial size is the same in all organisms and in all eggs. Excellent. And that would do it for you. you yeah. 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 So, well, you, so again, it, it, it is in that sense, that was kind of what I was getting at. The, the, the same property that increased the size of the egg 
is the property that decreases the, uh, the, 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 the lifetime of the protein, because you dilute out that particular degradation factor. But it would mean that Bitcoin would have a degradation factor that was specific to it. Right. That, that is because, not, because the cell cycle degradation things are everything else is running at the same time clock. And so all the other degradation processes are still running at their normal clock in the bigger eggs. But Bitcoin's in this model would be going at a slower. That would be cool. And that could be a property that is conserved in the Bitcoin protein, evidently, and would be a property that could be recognized from the Bitcoin sequence, potentially, if one recognized what was found. Yeah? Sorry, so this is kind of more people will explain, but I missed. So in uh, Moscow or in other uh, flies, so the developmental clock is uh, the same. The same. Yeah. So they, they go as fast. They go as fast, but uh, the argument would be that if the protease was more diluted, you would change the lifetime. Yeah, and that's a great model. Yeah. 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 Why did you pick up mutants in that period? You would think. Yeah, right. So. Uh, What you would have to, yeah, so the, what we don't pick up is mutants that aren't specific for oogenesis or for that. So if it were really specific for Bitcoin, which is what I was arguing, remember, because we, we wanted it to be specific because we want all the other processes to go at a normal clock rate, but Bitcoin to slow down, then the protein should be specific. If it's really specific, then you knock it out. It shouldn't be homozygous lethal one should have obtained it as a um, uh, maternal effect mutation. The only uh, way of saving that argument is to say that there are some other things that are going on in the making of the egg, a big egg, that happen during oogenesis. And that same degradation property is going to be, that same degradation gene is going to be used for those and would be slowed down or sped up in the big, you know, that the, the, this making the big egg involves diluting out a particular factor. And that when you made a mutation in it, you messed up oogenesis and never got an egg. And that might be harder to, uh, the other more likely explanation is that when uh, Trudy and Yanni did the screens for maternal effect mutations, they stopped too soon. They may have hit 90% saturation, but there's still that interesting 10% 10, 10 interesting genes out there that haven't been identified. OK. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, step back a little bit and, and try to address the question of um, information content in the Bitcoin gradient. So we've shown that it's stable. And uh, what stable means is between many different embryos, if you see this particular concentration, you know you are at this percent egg length. And that's with a 10% level, which is basically enough to distinguish one cell from its immediate neighbors. Now, historically, if you look at how the fly field looked at the original process of, thought about the original process of segmentation, uh, but after the initial gap genes and payroll genes and segment clarity genes and maternal effect genes, they were kind of arranged in a hierarchy, a conceptual hierarchy. And the view was that these genes function to gradually establish precise patterns. And in that view, you know, the, the, a simple version of that view is that what maternal effect genes are really doing is setting up blocks of gap gene expression. And then the gap genes kind of interact with each other and make more complicated patterns. And then you get eventually pair rule patterns that are built on the, and so that you gradually establish a precise determination of cell fate that is therefore uh, allows you to say the information content is low. And that's how people we used to think before Thomas Greger actually did the careful measurements of the Bitcoin gradient. That, it, you know, it just was enough to give you some kind of a polarity. It wasn't a lot of information there. The information complexity increases at each step in this kind of model. And there'd be 
less or little correlation between uh, the initial input and the final, final pattern or the final response. If you're going through many steps and you're generating pattern, uh, and each step subject to noise, and so you're going to be, you're going to, uh, uh, there's going to be less correlation between input and output. Uh, one of the feel, one of the, the, the outlooks that, uh, particularly in the the Princeton, uh, Princeton Bicoid Consortium, which is, I guess, Bill Bialik and Thomas Greger and my myself and the uh, participants in the lab, that, a view that arose about the time that uh, we became aware of how precise the gradient was, is that the sense that the initial gradient is actually a, a very rich source of spatial information, reproducible, and it is translated into a, a rich pattern. So this is essentially an information transfer. Information is in a graded distribution concentrate, and we want to take the same information but convert it or translate it into a, a system of discrete gene expressions without losing any information. And that that's the way to think about it. If information complexity would be stable or potentially even decrease with steps. And there would be a, still a strong correlation between the, the, the uh, uh, it's based in part on this observation of, of Thomas's that the gradient was so incredibly reproducible. Uh, so, but it really depends on, and this gets to the, the real theme of the second part of this talk is how well do, can, even if the information content is really high, and you can say, well, the information, can you put the same amount of RNA into the egg and it has the same lifetime and the and the fusion properties aren't very different and you, you really get the same gradient out, that's physics. And so uh, there's not necessarily going to be a lot of variability in, but can cells really use all the information that's there? And so the approach that, um, Julia Dubuis, who's a graduate student, who's working uh, kind of with all of us, but, but more specifically with Thomas and Bill, uh, did was to actually go back and try to measure the precision in the information content that ex in the gap genes at 15 minutes into cycle 14. You realize there are four different gap genes. What, I, what we did was we generated antibodies in different animals to all four so that we could simultaneously in the same embryo characterize all four expression patterns and then characterize those, uh, uh, the expression patterns. And initially, we used a, uh, a statistics, once you get to how you're going to express that you can, <coughs> in Julian's thesis, which is quite beautiful, you should read it if you have a, a chance, translates this spatial information into bits of information that allows you then to ask how much information you can look at how many bits of inf information are in the uh, bicoid gradient, how, what's the information content of the gap genes, the total information content, um, mutual information. Uh, yeah? There's no time. There's one time. There is one time. We pick the time where. But these things are very dynamic. Yeah, right. And so there, so there could be more information, you know. But the, uh, our point is really that if we identify a single time where we have enough precision to specify cells different from each other, then it could be that if we'd looked five or ten minutes earlier or ten minutes later, we would have the same level of precision or less or more. But if there is a time where the gap gene expression patterns contain enough information to specify single cells, then the embryo would be really smart to use that time point for the next step. Can you do this over time? Yes. And uh, Julian didn't do it. Um, the, the next version of the manuscript a uh, version of this is kind of doing this. Okay. Um, but uh, just uh, the conclusions, as you, as you see from Julian's paper, was that if you ask, and if you measure, these are non-normalized, so they're, well, they're basically uh, um, 
the, the, the concentrations. Normally, if you do an expression profile, you would anchor, you would normalize with the, ex, the, the top the highest expression or low. These are uh, the, our strategy is to always include. Uh, <clears throat> I just have wild head memory is not normalized. Use absolute values. And if and I told you, the, if you to, tell us the absolute intensities of these four genes along the axis of the embryo, and you know all four, can you say precisely where you are? Or how precisely can you say where you are? And to do this, you have to change your view of the gap genes from genes that are expressed in blocks to normal distributions with graded edges, because the information content is really going to be in the graded regions of gap gene expression. And if these are reproducible, and the positions are reproducible, if you can get information from all four of these genes, you will know where you are to a precision of about 1%, which is, again, sufficient for us to tell cells one cell from the next. So if the embryo is as good as we are, in measuring concentrations and reading concentrations. The embryo can use that gap gene information to set up different fates. Now, this allows us to do a, take a slightly different approach. And this is the approach that uh, Mariela Petkova has using to try to use this data to build what are essentially lookup tables. So a, uh, a pattern gene expression, so, and, and then we'll plot it out here. So if a cell is actually sitting at position 5, or 50% egg length, it sees a particular combination of, of concentrations of these four genes. And it makes a prediction of where it thinks it is. So this is the translate. This is the kind of like a picture of what we think the embryo is doing. And then it activates at its estimated, depending on what it estimates the position, it will activate a pair rule gene or not. So you can then use this as a kind of an internal representation of what we believe the embryo is doing in, in sitting at a position, seeing a given concentration of gap gene, estimating what you could call position, which is really, do I activate this pair rule gene or not? And <coughs> we can use these lookup tables. In, the, in a certain sense, the width of this little bar here is, is a, this is real data. So it, it doesn't show up here. And I'm, I'm cutting lots of stuff out. But uh, gives you a sense of the accuracy of a cell's ability to measure. So what I could have showed you, or it would have been maybe helpful, is that if you had only one gap gene, you would, a cell sitting there, and if you could only see one, would in some places be, the, this would be very, very, very fuzzy, because we'd have no idea where it was. And in some places, it would be very precise. But maybe there would be two places where you'd have that precise combination. And you couldn't decide. And so you get complicated patterns with individual gap genes that become increasingly less complicated as you add in more and more gap genes, until you get to a perfect lookup table. Now, this becomes interesting, useful for us. I'm going to use it a little bit later because it allows us to evaluate the information content of uh, the eggs in terms of gap gene. How, how good is the, the how reproduce, how good are the, the, the cell fate decisions? How good is the cell's ability to estimate where it is in the embryo based on the fuzziness or sharpness of the line for us? So one ensemble is uh, variability from embryo to embryo. So for yeah. example, so, uh, yeah. embryos, right. And so the scale and, uh, yeah. So this is a different experiment actually compared to this experiment. Uh, there are about 300, 400 embryos evaluated at five-minute intervals during cycle 14 to, and then the 15 to 20-minute interval was chosen as the most information rich. 
in that the line here was the least fuzzy and allowed the tightest predictions for where parallel genes would form. Yeah. So it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it, 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 it's really yeah. It's absolutely true that you could get more information maybe if you looked at time, or maybe you wouldn't get any better. That's an interesting question to ask. Would you get better? Can you get below one percent if you integrate over time? That's a question that could be asked now with this data set. statement that the system is perfect because you have one nuclear precision, and that's exactly how much precision is there. If you can do five times better with time, and you are integrating over time, it becomes a lot less of a striking statement. Oh, no, it is. No, I think it, my personal view is I wrote in 1984 or 5, this paper where I argued that there were many more meaningful positional uh, cell fates than there were even cells along the anterior posterior axis of the blastoderm. And <laughs> so I would love your result. I, 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 uh, but it would be interesting to know. But you see, we can do that now. We can actually ask whether integration of additional time points gives us greater precision or not. Yes. So it could be uh, all the variability could be uh, from one embryo to another, and then we gain nothing right. from every over time yeah. in a single, no. single test. So I, I, we, uh, we, uh, the direction that this project took was not in that direction, but the data is there to do that. And that is the right thing to do. Uh, it, it, that is among the right things to do. That's an interesting one. <laughs> Yeah. And there, um, it can, without using a bitcoin radio, they can centralize the, the, uh, the spindle. And that's actually a difficult problem to solve. And one of the ways it does that is using the mechanical forces. And I'm just wondering, in principle, mechanics is a very rapid way of transmitting information on, on, um, mm -hmm. on the shape and size. Yeah. And Could be feedback. Uh, is, there, is there an opportunity where? Uh, yeah. Cool questions, yes. Unanswered, yes. Unanswered. OK. So um, I, I want to use this just while we use it. Uh, so what I, what I want to do is in the last 15 minutes or so, go back to this um, uh, question of how the embryo does this. And um, we've been talking about this as though this is bicoid. But a worrisome thing, of course, is that I've already told you yesterday that bicoid is not the only anterior posterior patterning system in the embryo. There's another one that's made by uh, an RNA localized the posterior end of the embryo, which um, regulates the translation of a maternally supplied, maternally supplied hunchback RNA, which is the same protein the bicoid's regulating as well. Uh, there is also a uh, a receptor tyrosine kinase signaling system that regulates the localization of another. So all of these systems govern or uh, have great impacts in certain regions of the embryo. Bicoid, in terms of its phenotype, is missing mostly anterior and thoracic structures. Uh, so people in the past have kind of partitioned these genes into different roles. Uh, what we would like to know, so I've just told you that the embryo can be precise. Is the embryo precise because it's using all of this information? And if we were to reduce the embryo down to having only bicoid information, how much? What can it do? <clears throat> and what time? We must be running. Ten we have 10 minutes. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, so we are running out of time. So OK, so I will. Um, Go through two quick experiments. I'll, this is the experiment that I did, and I'll do it in one slide, even though I, I, I put 18 slides <laughs> about this exp my experiment into this talk. And we're going to cut them all out. 
Um, but to make embryos which are, have only big white content, you have to also not only remove the initial inputs, nanos and torsolite, you have to remove the downstream transcription factors that would be inhibitory for big white's patterning effects. And I don't, can't explain, other, uh, explain that to you other than to tell you that that involves making genetic mosaics of, of, in a complicated process. And this is the only picture that you really need to look at. This is a wild-type larvae that would hatch at the end of embryonic development. This is the pattern of knips and giant and even skipped. And if you have only bicoid, what you have is an embryo which has patterns out to abdominal segment six, which is a lot of the pattern, and um, is uh, uh, gap genes, basically the whole run of gap genes. And I can tell you that this patterning depends on bicoid, because if we now remove bicoid from these embryos, just looking here, this is what you get. You go from this to this when you remove bicoid. So this is what bicoid is doing in these embryos. And it, they do it pretty accurately, but I won't. Uh, so, so now we're going to go back and we're going to say, well, we have this bicoid gradient. We haven't monkeyed with it. It's the same in these embryos. And somehow the embryo is able to pattern out to 60 or 70 percent egg length in a gradient that's as flat as this area is here. So how does it do this? How does bicoid pattern? Up to this point, most people would have said bicoid is important for the anterior region of the embryo. When you uh, remove it, you still get an abdomen. And that tells it's somewhat redundant with patterning of other. But this tells, uh, the result is that bicoid can pattern an abdomen. We don't know whether it does it directly or indirectly. And we don't know that because we don't really know what the targets are. And we don't understand. Directly, presumably, means that bicoid binds to the enhancers of target genes and activates them. The enhancers of genes that are expressed all the way out here. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, ex what I believe is an exciting set of experiments that really begin to address what is the nature of bicoid binding? What's the nature of the concentration-dependent binding? If bicoid is able to pattern and pattern directly, how do you build enhancers that can respond to different concentrations? These are experiments of Colleen Hannon and Shelby Blythe in the lab. Uh, in the simple model, you know what it is. And right, so the idea is that anterior targets should have enhancers with low affinity. And they would only bind bicoid at high concentrations. That would be the standard textbook model. So we'd like to be able to first test whether that's true, and then ask if that is true, can we understand the molecular basis for it? The approach that Colleen has taken is first to try to identify uh, bicoid. We've talked about these four gap genes, but there are many other genes that are expressed in anterior posterior patterns in the embryo, in fly embryos. So this bicoid, and bicoid governs all of these directly or indirectly. So what she wanted to know, how many sites are there where bicoid binds? And to do that, she used a <coughs> chip seeker. Uh, chromatin uh, uh, immunoprecipitation using bicoid as an antibody to pull down the sites in the entire genome that bind bicoid DNA. And in her hands, the reproducible number were using cutoffs that she chose to use are 127 sites in early cycle 14 embryos. These are hand-selected, visually selected embryos, somewhere between 50 and 100 embryos that bind bicoid. And these 127 sites bind bicoid 
in wild type embryos. They also bind embry bicoidin embryos where we've removed all the other maternal inputs and altered all the other gene expression patterns. They don't change. And so we think that binding, even though expression patterns change when you remove the other genes, that binding is a property that's kind of independent of the actual uh, uh, the, the, the downstream the, 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 the downstream output of the gene. Okay, uh, and so then so now she has a bunch of targets. But what you really want to know is, do these targets show different concentration dependencies? And so that's hard to do in a wild type embryo where every cell has a different concentration of bicoid. So what Colleen then did was to develop a set of lines that, in which bicoid RNA is expressed in the mother, but with a three prime UTR that prevents its localization. So it is made in the egg and uniformly distributed through the whole egg cytoplasm. And she drives the expression of these RNAs with um, different promoters that drive different levels of RNA production and therefore different levels of protein production. What that means is she can make a large collection of embryos, hundreds of embryos, that mimic the concentrations at specific points along the gradient. And then use these embryos uh, and with defined concentrations based on uh, calculations from, from Westerns or however you want to approach that, to ask if you have a set of 100, 1,027 it enhancers or regions of DNA that bind bicoid in wild type embryos, do those enhancers partition themselves into groups depending on their concentration, their bi bicoid binding uh, in, the, in these different concentration lines? And the answer is yes, they do. Oh, the answer is that they function, well, the lines are fu interesting and functional, but the important answer is that <clears throat> with the three lines that she has, she can identify four classes of DNA binding. This is a very crude division. Uh, you could, I'm convinced you could probably parse out more classes here. But for our practical purposes, statistically, it was easiest just to identify, break these genes into four classes, some which are we call high affinity because even under, under all bicoid concentrations, regardless of the promoter that's used, they are bound. Others are low affinity because they're only bound at the highest concentrations. And intermediate low affinities and uh, intermediate, uh, intermediate affinity, we have four classes. So these are, so far this is just, our, this is classes based on concentration. Though what you want to know, is, is there, a, do these, uh, are, we imagine that these function as enhancers. And so you'd like to ask, do these pieces of DNA show, what are the expression patterns associated with these pieces of DNA? Uh, if you hook them up to reporters, and there are different Drosophila databases. We've gone through four different databases here. But the low affinity ones tend to be associated with expression in the anterior ends of the embryo. And the high affinity ones have expression throughout. Uh, these are the ones which are expressed even at very low concentrations, and they tend to be expressed. They tend to, these pieces of DNA tend to drive expression. We can do that uh, by really, with a really large data sets were generated in Stark's lab in Vienna. and. You can show that there are significantly different behaviors for all four classes in terms of where they activate expression. So now we're excited because we have, for the first time, a big enough set of enhancers that we can begin to say, what are the characters that would determine high affinity versus low affinity? Ah, so they all of these, uh, if you, ask, you can ask first, what are the, 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 the motifs? that are present. And they all, 
the, if you can ask the computer, <laughs> what are the most common motif? What are the, the three most common motifs are two different bicoid sites that are known as the high affinity and low affinity site, and uh, a gene called Zelda, which is a chromatin architecture, which is a gene that's involved in early activation of transcription in Drosophila. Those are the three most abundant motifs. Uh, Uh, if you take the DNA, though, and you look at these regions, you can in vitro. Yes. You're just getting Zelda because it's a coactivator. Yes, it's a coactivator. It, it, yeah, it, these are, it argues that these are probably early enhancers that are driving early expression in the embryo, so they have Zelda sites. Right? But they have bicoid sites. That's the next most abundant site. Uh, they all, all these pieces of DNA, if you take them out, not all of them, Colleen's done 10. They bind bicoid in what are called gel shifts experiments, which is a physical measurement of bicoid protein binding to the DNA sequences. That's interesting, but they all bind with the same KD. So we can't, whether they're in the high affinity or the low affinity, because we can't distinguish that at all. That's telling us that naked DNA doesn't mimic the concentration specificity that we see in the um, in vivo, what distinguishes the peaks? Okay, a really sensible, easy model. Whoop, would have been that if you counted the densities of the bicoid sites, you looked at the, that the high affinity sites would have lots of bicoid. Uh, and the low affinity sites would have few bicoid binding sites. And so we did that, uh, you know, that type of, and that's not true. We don't, and we also don't see differences between different kinds of bicoid sites. But we see one thing which is really amazing is that the exact opposite of what we expected. That the intermediate and low sites that have the lowest affinity for bicoid are the ones that have the most bicoid sites. And then we ask, is there any other? Ah. So that suggests all these data is pointing that there's something complicated going on here. They don't do it in vivo. Maybe there's something about chromatin and the availability or accessibility of these sites. And so you can um, measure, all the sites are, have a property that's called accessibility. When you do chromatin assays, it means the DNA is available to some reagent. The reagent we use is the, uh, the ATAC-seq protocol. And uh, much of DNA is wrapped in, around histones and not easily um, accessible to the reagents. And regions of naked DNA, which is characteristic of enhancers that are sitting out there waiting for proteins to bind, are often accessible. And these sites are predominantly all have high degrees of accessibility. Uh, but they have a, there's a peculiarity. Uh, the way chromatin is made is that you have something called a nucleosome, which is a, a, a bunch of histone proteins that are balled together. And you wrap DNA around them. And that gives you, that protects that DNA, if you will. What people, I used to think that DNA just kind of wrapped around histones in a kind of random way. But you can, we know now that the sequence, there's a sequence specificity in this wrap that has to do with the, how easy the DNA is to bend and also the preferences for certain bases to lie in certain grooves in the, in the nucleus. So you can take DNA and you can ask on a very small scale, how likely is this DNA to be wrapped in histones? Wrapped, wrapped around histones. And when you do that, you can get a measure. And the, what we find is that that turns out to be one of the best criteria for distinguishing between high and low affinity sites, in that the low affinity sites have a very, very high propensity to be wrapped around histones and be unavailable and inaccessible. And the high affinity sites are just, open, you know, have l a lower 
lower tendencies and tend to be uh, tend to be open. And so the model that I'm going to give you. All right, so high affinity sites are openly accessible. Low affinity sites are closed. High affinity sites, uh, <clears throat> these have moderate density. These have a high density of bicroid. So what we're arguing now is that if you want to build, and the way that the animals build concentration-dependent enhancers is that they balance a proclivity to wrap histones and be unaccessible with a number of bicoid sites that will uh, do that will make that DNA accessible. What that uh, and so in the, in the anterior region, then low affinity sites will tend to have histones. High affinity sites, maybe also because they are have enriched for Zelda, which is I didn't point that out, but that was this this cofactor. Have high sites will have the bicoid motif, binding motif, immediately available there. So you don't need, it doesn't, you, low concentrations were able to bind here. High concentrations, we would have to argue then, have the property of excluding nucleosomes, opening up the DNA. Uh, so these uh, high affinity, the low affinity sites, for them to be expressed, you have to open them up. And what we're going to argue is that the high concentrations of bicoid is, in fact, the feature that opens those, uh, those proteins up, those, those regions up. So then you, the uh, concentration dependence then becomes the balance between the nucleosome preferences and, and other, potentially other factors as well that make these sites inaccessible, plus the high frequency of bicoid sites. And so you can test the, I, I'll just tell you that we, you can test that. And we, uh, what this model implies is an unusual feature of, that you don't normally assign to homeodomain proteins, that they remodel chromatin. Generally, we think of transcription factors as sloshing through the nucleus, looking for naked sites of DNA to bind to and to activate transcription. But what we're arguing for these concentration-dependent cases is that the nuclear, that the transcription factor, and this is a homeodomain transcription factor, as typical as you can get, uh, has the property that it opens chromatin and it uses that property to drive concentration dependence. So I'm going to stop there. I, really, I went over. I'm sorry, but uh, thank you. Good, uh, good audience. Okay, we're going to. Kill that. Uh.